You are now entering Paleo Radio. It's actually a little bit of a lie, everybody. Angela was totally tricking you. Joe Elder is not here today. You're listening to Paleo Radio. I am the creator and co-host of the show, ordinarily with Joe Elder. But today's kind of a different day. He and his girl, Kay, they are on the super fancy and fabulous Paleo Jet making their way over to the West Coast, uh, presumably for something to do with Bilderberg or something to do with some New World Order enterprise that he's involved with. But he's over on the West Coast. I think he's going to spend some time with Kay's mom. And So it was actually a decision that was made what? In the, it was, what, like 6 o'clock last night? Yeah, last night. Yeah, 6 o'clock last night. And by the way, for those who uh, just heard that soft little voice, <laughs> that little voice is... My wife, Angela, and I don't know if we ever been on air, on radio, at the same time. I don't remember. Maybe at Olivet College? For like Maybe a at second. Olivet College for just, a, for just a second. So, But you have been the voice of commercials for the show, which are hilarious. Like the one, what was the, the PETA-friendly bearskin rug, which, by the way, we now have one, right? Yes. Yes, <laughs> we we took it we took it seriously hardcore, and we ended up going to get one. But you were the voice on that, and you've been on the voice of a number of intros for the program. Yeah, yeah. So, but you're with me today. But so Joe, he's out of the area, and that's not the only little change that's going to be happening today. The other one has to do with a phone number. Okay, so ordinarily we have you call. Uh, a, a certain phone number that we announced numerous times throughout the show, but we've been having problems with line one. And so we're giving out this number today. So you got to be really good in case it, it makes it difficult because we've been encouraging everybody for, I don't even know how long now to program it. Just put it in your phone, program it. That way you don't even have to remember it. And now I'm telling you at least for the time, and you can do this, I guess, indefinitely, apparently, but I'm going to give you a different number. So write this down. Get your get your paleo pen and paper in hand. And here's this number. Write it down. Okay. 616-656-2619. I'm going to do it one more time. 616-656-2619. So the last four numbers are different. Okay. So I, you got to remember. 2619. So if you're on the road or you're at work... Right, listening to the program, all your friends, of course, are loving every second of it, and you want to give us a call, the number 616-656-2619. All right, now listen, things are going to flow a little bit differently for this show. It's just a fact. You know, I've, I used to host Paleo Radio by myself, in fact, uh, for many years I did, and so it's not as if this is a foreign thing to me. But the last time that I did it by myself, it was a special Team Tiny Dancer episode. And at the time, I had no interest in talking about politics. In fact, I told people right out of the gate, I said, listen, do me a favor. Don't even make me talk about this stuff. And I think at the time, I think the hubbub was about Hillary's health. And I said, I'm just simply not in the mood to talk about this. There were a bunch of, there were a bunch of things going on at the time. Of course, the election was happening. But I wasn't interested in that. And here's the thing. As, as I was reflecting, even before Joe called me to let me know he needed the jet, even before that, I was thinking about it and I said, you know, I guess on that score, not a lot has actually changed. You know, I, I look at the news and I, I get up and I, you know, I get online, I get on my phone, I check out Facebook. I go on Twitter, and I get bummed. I do. I mean, it's, it's kind of like one of those, you got to bite the bullet for this line of work. And I love doing what I do. I love talking about these sorts of things. But it gets really sad. 
It just gets super depressing. And it gets really hard when you end up spraining your butt, which is totally what ended up happening this week. It's a true story. For those who (laughs) have been listening to the show for a minute or two, they know that my nickname is White Chocolate because I'm pretty dope on the basketball court. I am. It's just a fact. I am. I'm winning, I'm winning games at 21 left and right. I'm doing a fantastic job. I'm, I'm passing the basketball like Magic Johnson. You know, I'm dribbling super fancy between my legs looking like a rave dancer with basketball in his hand. I just need him with, it needs to glow like glow sticks and dribble with it. But I love playing. I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a fact. I love playing. But I go up for this shot and I'm playing basketball. I'm playing with these guys. And I go for this beautiful fade, this beautiful jumper. And when I land, it just doesn't feel entirely right. It kind of felt like maybe there was a pop kind of in my back. Kind of right near the rib area. Or not, not the ribs, I take that back. Right? By the, uh, by the hips. Not by the ribs. By the hips. And I, I tried playing. I don't know for what. Like Angela was there. <laughs> Angela was there. She caught part of it. But I, I tried playing for a couple minutes, and I said, "Hey guys, I got to call a timeout." I was I was being real manly. I was I was kind of like, "Oh, let me just stretch it out." I think I, I think I just kind of got a Charlie horse in here. So I go over to the side, and I'm laying on the ground. I'm got you know I'm got my back on the ground. I'm looking up, and I'm thinking, "I don't know how good this is, man." I'm doing all these stretches. I'm thinking, man, I don't do a lot of stretches. Maybe that's something I got to do more. I'm having one of those real real moments with myself. So I go back out thinking, oh, well, you know, like one of those movies or where you see it in games or something where the guy comes out and he's limping a little bit, but boy, he's manning it out. Just got to stretch it out. He's back in the game. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing that. So I go out back in the game. And I try playing. I do a fantastic job. Arguably an MVP of the game. 100% from the floor, including two three-pointers. Felt good. But by the end of that game, I wasn't even jumping for rebounds that were like right in my face. I mean, there was no moving for me at all. Like none. This ball's coming straight down at me. It's coming straight down. And I'm just like, there's just no way in the world that I'm even jumping for this thing. That I'm even jumping for it because it was, it was too much pain. Too much pain. And I'm like, and so I'm sitting there and I'm like, hey guys, I'm done. I'm done with that. I, I simply can't play. There's no way in all the world that I'm going to be able to play anymore. And so I go walking home. Or I go walking to get out of the gym my wife and my kids are there, and I'm kind of feeling a little bit old by this point. I mean, seriously, I'm kind of just barely wobbling. <laughs> and, and I'm like, this is not good whatsoever at all. Get in the car. We're on our way home. And by the time I get home, there is simply no way that I'm able to walk without the assistance, without the assistance of my wife. No way at all. So she's helping me up uh, up the stairs. Now I'm totally looking like mad old at this point. I'm old Grandpa Jer, old Gramps Maya, and I get up there. Can't even can't sit down. Can't lay down. Can't turn to my right. Can't turn to my left. I'm gritting my teeth. I haven't cried over pain in a long time. Go to the you know call the VA. The VA plugs it in. Their algorithm that determines whether or not they're, you know, what you should do. And they said something actually really awesome and something I've complained about on this show. They said just as I would hope that they would say. And they said, number one, the algorithm states that you need to go immediately. Might be a rupture in your back. So you got to go like now. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay. And they said, but you, the other thing is, we have to tell you don't go to Battle Creek. Because it's not, it, they don't provide the services of this nature. And I thought, you're the first person, the first telling nurse I've ever heard to say that. 
And I was so grateful. This is a big shout out. I'm not even kidding. This, this is a massive shout out to the people over at the VA because that they have to be responsive. That has to be. Because they're those telenurses are out of Ohio. They they're having to be responsive to veterans and what they're saying from around the region when they go, listen, you're telling me that I got to drive to Battle Creek, right, an hour and something away when I know that inside the facility it's this small kind of unit. They, they don't facilitate things like this. They'll give you some meds and send you home sort of thing. So big shout out. But when all that's going on, it's kind of hard to think about the news. It's kind of hard to think about the news uh, over the weekend because I was so excited because my son uh, had his last basketball game of, the, of this season so far. And you know what? It was his first season. First season he's ever played. Athanasius. My second born, but now the oldest in our family. He played his first season of basketball, and he was this guy. You want to talk about a committed dude. You, I don't even have to say anything. You can go verify for yourself. We recorded, as a family, we recorded uh, and did kind of a little presentation, in fact. I think Angela did an amazing job. We recorded uh, Athens basketball games. You know, so you can go and check them out on Facebook. They're all public. You can go check it out. But he just, he had an amazing time. But he lost the last game. Perfect year. Well, they had a tie, right? They had a tie with the team. And I don't think it was this team. It may have been. But I don't think it was. I think it was another team. They played this team before and they won. But this time, this time they lost. And it was the only loss of the whole year that he experienced and his team. And there was part of me, and I told him this, I mean, flat out. We talk about stuff like this, but I told him, I said, you know, it, there's a part of me that is kind of glad, and I, and I hate using that term because it's almost like, you know, this mischievous ring in my hands, twizzle in my stash kind of thing. But I said, I'm kind of glad almost that you experienced this. That you experienced a year where you literally just dominated and that you got better and better every single time. And that you really rocked it. That you had more good things than bad things. And fewer bad things each and every time you tried. That you worked on it throughout the year. I'm proud, and I'm, but I'm glad that even with all of that, when push came to shove at the very end, that you lost. That you experienced that, uh, that feeling of giving your best and realizing that on that day, that just didn't, that wasn't enough on that day. It didn't work out. But I'm so proud of him. And I'm proud of the way that he took it. He's an athlete. You know, so I mean, with all that going on, now I guess it's time to go to Huffington Post and read what's happening with Donald Trump. I'm dead serious about this, folks. It's a real, it's a real, <laughs> it's a real crisis all the time is that on the one hand, I love what I do. I love reading these stories. I love talking about it. And yet on the other hand, I love life. And I hate being sad all the time. I hate reading the stories that I simply can't trust. I hate struggling to believe people and institutions that I ought to believe. I sincerely loathe it. I hate it every single time. There's not one time where I read some shifty partisan person say something and, you know, just ridiculously absurd, but it's virtue signaling the team all right. I never read that and go, oh, man, that's hilarious. Or, oh, man, that's really, that's really awesome. We should all be just like that person. Never. Never. And it's sad because so many of these people, these cartoons, these are people and institutions that historically have played a really significant role 
just in keeping America somewhat sane. <laughs> sane enough to thrive in spite of our differences. 616-656-2619. We got a lot to talk about. We'll be back after this. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. All right. It's true. There's so much to talk about, and I'm looking at this Chuck Norris video that's just absolutely hilarious. Have you seen this Chuck Norris video, Angela, where uh, Chuck Norris has this gun? I'd love to know what movie it's from. But he's got this gun, and he's totally popping people that are they're hilarious video memes from YouTube of people stumbling downstairs or you know trying to do a, a trick and falling and stuff. And basically, it's his shot that's taking him down. Have you seen that? No, I it's haven't totally seen that yet. totally hilarious, distracting me from really important things. All right, let's go to the phones. We have Rick in GR. He wants to talk about Trump. All right, Rick, what do you want to talk about Trump for? What's this about? Talk to him. Well, it just seems like I told your screener, who is your wife, I guess. Yes. Um, that uh, this Trump administration seems to be a constant soap opera. Mm-hmm. Now, he's in a little bit of trouble, I think, with, you know, the uh, uh, controversy surrounding his attorney general, who who may have lied. And if he, if he didn't commit perjury legally, he, he at least was not totally truthful with the Senate mm-hmm. at his hearing. And there's other things going on with the Russia investigation. So now mm-hmm. Trump, in his usual way, tries to distract. It's what Ross Perot used to call throwing gorilla dust, you know. And uh, now he's accusing the Obama administration, his predecessor, of tapping his phone. Well, here's the thing. I heard somebody analyze this. I forget who it was. Now. It might have been Howard Dean. He says, either way, Trump is in trouble. Either he's making this up which means he's lying and trying to distract us from what's really going on. Or let's assume it is true. If it is true, it would have had to have been Mr. Obama getting a federal judge to authorize what they call a FISA warrant, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, I believe that mm-hmm. stands for. Yeah. And they could only do that, uh, a judge would only issue that warrant upon probable cause. Yeah. Not that See, Mr. Trump had done that. something wrong necessarily himself. Yeah. But, you know, maybe the Russians were, you know, in other words, either way, this is a bad story for Mr. Trump. And I guess he hadn't thought of that because, frankly, I think he's getting rather desperate and rather angry uh, that all this is coming out. You know, not so much that it's happening. But, what's coming out exactly? Well, what's coming out is that, uh, first of all, I mean, I know I know that one of the things came out is that RT, that RT is a big player. And that people who people who believe that third parties need a voice, um, that people who believe uh, that the two party system is a problem, or that America and imperialism abroad is a serious issue, that those people are problems. I know that's come out. That's actually made it in an official report. But I'm wondering, like, what exactly has come out about this? I mean. But, well, Verifiable stuff I'm talking about, like stuff that's not well, not, not speculation, not anonymous source, not this guy said that, that person well, said this. Well, it has dude. not been proved no. uh, concretely that the Trump campaign, I can't say administration because this is before the election, there's no absolutely incontrovertible proof that the Trump campaign colluded with the Russians. However, I believe it has been pretty much acknowledged a hundred percent by the CIA and other intelligence agencies mm. that the Russian government, probably at the behest of Mr. Putin because he basically runs everything there, that they were trying to influence the election in Trump's favor. Well, mm. Mr. Trump did win, so they did try. They succeeded. The question is, did mm. the Russian effort have a direct <sighs> effect on the election, and did the Trump campaign have they come up? Have they provided any? Has anyone? And this is one of the things. I mean, I listen. I I'm I'm not taking it out on you. Okay, you're not I, apologizing for no. Putin, are you? Uh, no, I, that's ridiculous to even suggest. Well, but, I'm just wondering. But <laughs> I well, no, that'd be that. But that's the thing, though. There's a lot of wondering going on. There's a lot of well, maybe 
or but possibly or I can imagine and I'm not saying you I'm saying like this ticks me off about even going online and reading news I mean the, the stuff that you say when you say well, what well, kind it's of proof acknowledged you, what kind of 100% proof would you have that the I'm not Russians asking did this? for 100% proof I'm asking for something that's actually verifiable and I'm asking for something more than simply well, saying like that RT what Well I mean take? come on we come on well, I've talked on the air publicly about my opinion on numerous occasions on this show at length, in fact, about my opinion regarding the the report that came out and talking about why I think it's a joke. And so when people come up and they go, well, but there's, you know, the, this group has said that or this group has said that. See, man, this is all publicly verifiable stuff way before any of these people even came in. This is the data that people are debating. And some of it's data from 2013. This talking about RT. Not that long ago. Oh, come on now. I mean, and the thing is, we all know RT. We, in fact, at this station we specifically, RT. No, I don't know that much about it. Does that stand for this, Russian this television? Station, no, this station, we used I don't, some of the stuff, uh, Tom Hartman, RT, man. Well, that doesn't make it right. Well, that's what I'm saying. But R, that's, he is part of the whole, the, if, that's what, if that's what flies... If that's what's accepted, that's the most verifiable thing so far, practically, that they've put out. What is? Every, the, the report. You can actually go in and look at the report and verify it. In that sense, I, I applaud it. But I say, was anything beyond that, I mean, it, can you sh- show me anything that's not anonymous? So, so you're it's saying, no. despite the fact that uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty well acknowledged by the intelligence agencies that... Uh, Putin and the Russians wanted Trump in there, and that Trump never says anything bad about Putin. Oh, that's not true. The second you, second you, part's you, not true. First part is. Keep what, going, though. When has he said anything bad about Trump, about Mr. Putin? Trump, that is. He, he, he inherently would have to say something bad about Putin to make the argument. But he hasn't. But, no, listen to me. To, to say what he said on TV talking to Bill O'Reilly when he, when he was decrying America for things that we've done... Right things that yeah, right I decry. That's, that's well, hold a, up, hold up. That he did that to, to. Not only did he say that it doesn't equivocate that that's not to say it's the same thing, but he's saying there's bad things over there. And so for him to say all of this really bad stuff is stuff that we do, and he's saying that that's still not as bad. Then to make that statement, he's inherently having to say. By that, I mean, it's it's part of the very nature of what he's saying, that he's also saying that that group over there, i.e. Putin, i.e. Russia, does things that are even worse. Moral equivalency, huh? No, I, I just said even worse. Well, That was the last thing I just said. Quanti- that's not, equ- that's not Quantitatively, but not qualitatively. Yeah. That's well, the thing. I, I, so, I, I'm sorry, no. I'm going to have to disagree with you. I don't, that's I, I don't, okay. I, that's all right. I don't think Russia, except yeah. when Gorbachev and Yeltsin were in there, has ever been even a halfway decent government. I'm not a Russophobe. I, I'm weirded out by the Russophobia on the left, in fact. That's actually a xenophobia well, that I don't time. understand. It's about, it's about time the left woke up to Russia. That's kind of like saying Decades it's about late. time. Yeah, man, that's... And see, that's the thing. That's where stuff starts running deep with me. I'm just like, I, I listen to people who talk about phobias or xenophobias, and I will let you go. But I just, you know... Yeah, I guess I just, I sit there... And I kind of think to myself, I'm like, you know, <sighs> I have to read some I, of the history of Russia. What's, what? Yeah, I'm going to let him go. I, I've read about the history of Russia, but people start sounding kind of like individuals that say, if you just read about the history of of Islam, or you read about the history of black people, or you read about the history of the Mexican government, or you read about the history of that, I, you know, you read about the history of gay people. You know, I, I, there is a phobia, unless people just simply don't believe there's a such thing as russophobia, if they think that's just not a real category. If it's a real category, I think we're swimming in it right now. I think half the people who talk about Russia can't really describe Russia much. And, I, and I'll tell you one reason why is because most, most people don't know Jack about Eastern Orthodoxy. They couldn't tell you Jack. About Eastern Orthodoxy, most American people, if you say, hey, man, what's an Antiochian church? Well, I don't know. I never heard such thing. Sounds like something foreign. It might be right up the road. They were our neighbors for crying out loud. 
boy, they use incense and they do this chanting stuff. They believe that leavened bread should be used and it's like a sacrifice. It's kind of Catholic-y, but not really. And that's the best that most people would have that even know anything about it at all. It plays an integral role in the culture of the Russian people. I mean, it's just a lot of this they-them stuff. A lot of identifying and all, you know, I think, what was it, last week we talked about the protesters that went out and protested against Putin publicly. Went out there and did that. There's people out there, and we talked about how much people had to brave it. Which means there's a lot more than what went out there. So I guess I'm not going to cookie cutter people. I'm not going to make my enemy a really convenient monolith. Man. I'm just not going to do it. I, it. It makes everything so much easier if you do it that way. It does. I mean, I, I fully grasp, I fully get why people want to do that, man. Because, boy, it makes it easy when you got just a dude that's the problem. And I, I made a meme. I think I shared it on Twitter. It's this old, old picture of the Freemason symbol in the middle of a, of a map. And it's got all of these kind of strings like the beautiful mind stuff going on. All over the place and the Freemason symbols in the middle. And I, I put a Russian flag over it. And I said, man, I said, look, this is serious stuff. This is serious, serious stuff. But I mean, this is what bums me out about even getting online. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Who, who likes that? Who who likes getting online and being like, dude, every single day I just get angry. Every day I just get real. <laughs> Who loves that? What kind of, I don't know. In the heat of that battle. <sighs> I mean, we're in the we're in the thick of a resistance. We're in the thick of a completely this radically divided country. <sighs> I'm just looking for something sane. If you have a fun story, <laughs> I'm serious. If you have a fun story, give us a call 616-656-2619. Get me out of this quagmire, this cesspool. Uh, 616-656-2619. We'll be right back. More Paleo Radio. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. All right. It's good to be alive, my friends. My name is Jeremiah Bannister. I am here flying solo today. I'm totally bummed in a way. But it's offset by this joyous thing that I've got going on. And what it is, is I've got my wife. I have Angela. And she's normally on the other side of this glass window thing that we've got here in the in the call center. And she hangs out with any kind of visitors that might pop in. And she talks to people on the phone. But today, she's in the studio with me. And she's working boards here. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> kind of working boards. She's helping, though. And I'm super glad that she's here today spending time with me. Yeah. And, you know, because in part, uh, because I want to talk today about something that I, I was going to mention it on the air. or yeah, Not on the air. I take that back. I'm sorry. I was going to mention it on Facebook. And if you're not following me on Facebook, I strongly encourage you. I have to implore you from... Uh, the most beautiful regions of my heart. Please go check it out. It's facebook.com slash jeremiah.bannister. And of course, make sure to follow Paleo Radio, facebook.com slash paleo radio. And just so everyone knows again, we're totally verified. So make sure to look for our logo, the black square with white lettering uh, underlined because we're awesome. But 
I was going to post something and and discuss it in kind of this long form writing that I do, and I haven't done it in a while, not publicly anyway. I haven't been writing anything for public consumption uh, for months, in fact. And I was going to break that uh, with a post to do with uh, our daughter, Teresa. But I figured, you know, I think I'm going to talk about it on the air. I And it's kind of in the tradition of the Paleocrat Diaries. And for people who are unaware of what they are, you got to go check them out. Paleocrat Diaries. I think this is, not, this is like number five. So it's not as if there's even a ton of these out there. The Team Tiny Dancer episode, I, I think, would count as one. Perfectionism in social media and friendship would count as one. Never give up would count as one. You know, so there's a number... There's a number of these segments where I talk about things just kind of from the heart. And I, I would include all my speeches now, all the speeches that I've done recently, Sunday Assembly, you know, e- even ones with the Solstice Dinner, stuff with Make-A-Wish, where I've just said, you know what, I'm just going to talk from my heart. I'm going to talk about something that just means something in life. That's not just always down or, or sad. I mean, in, in a lot of these have been, but there's always silver linings and there's always something. And going back on some of these, I thought about it. I even, you know, I mentioned perfectionism, social media, and friendship. I mentioned an older paleocrat diary. And, and actually something reminded me of that around that same time. In fact, I think, this, I think the video is premised on this. I, I wrote something. I was drawing with my daughter and I stumbled on this in a notebook in my office recently. And we have a bunch of different things on there, a bunch of writing, and I, I, won't, I won't talk about them all. But I put a little asterisk, and it said, never allow perfectionism to paralyze. It has a snake on there in the number two, with a tongue that looks very venomous, and teeth, everything else. But I thought about it, and I said, you know, perfectionism has not paralyzed me for a while now, I've grown. You know, I've changed. These speaking from my heart, it's, it's not just therapeutic. I mean, it genuinely is is <laughs> helping me in the future. It, it genuinely is therapeutic. In a very full sense, it's not just simply letting things out. It's saying, "Hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what we're dealing with in life. Where are you?" But our daughter, Teresa, we've noticed for, I would say, well, I would say most of the year, in fact. We've noticed that she was having a difficult time. She's in first grade. Teresa, you know, (laughs) Teresa's one of these girls, super fun, super crazy, super wild, creative, adventurous, sometimes a little mischievous, wanting to do pranks. She knows kind of what pranks are. <laughs> sometimes it's just that. I don't know if that's a prank, sweetheart. You don't want to You don't want to do that. But she's got a good heart. But we were noticing that her math was doing not too well. Not the worst. In fact, it was getting better. That was kind of the one area that was really doing well. And starting to do better. Same maybe with science. But writing and reading. You know, she was really struggling. And I remember her coming home and showing us these tests and I, I got mad at her. She had a test where she scored like a two. And it's like it, it went in but it didn't register all the way. I'm still going through things myself with the death of our daughter. You know? So I I, I remember, okay, she's not doing very well. We need to work with her. But then I started noticing, and I remember I got mad. I had this, like, knee-jerk reaction saying, man, you know why You got got a three or you got a two? And I remember I grabbed it, and she's crying, and she's saying she tried her hardest. And I said, well, I said, if you tried your hardest, I said, I don't believe that. I remember I told her that. But then I looked at the test. 
and I could read every single word. It was they were spelled wrong. I mean, they were they were spelled, they were not they weren't correct. But each and every one of them were legible. I mean, you could, you could read them. The letters weren't backward. She's missing some vowels. I mean, I've read I've read documents that are are written in a way that's even harder to read in old English. But she's at that level, though. And that's kind of at your kindergarten level. And she's struggled to make friends, in fact. Which seems so strange because she's an outgoing person. Because she seems to care for so many people. She enjoys playing. And she never really gets in trouble. I I don't... I think maybe with the exception of once since she began even going to school, that she's been below green. So she's, her behavior is fantastic. She might get herself in trouble sometimes by responding to people who are talking about God and saying that she doesn't, you know, our family doesn't believe in that and kind of sparks conversations. And But she doesn't just bring it up out of the blue. But she's behind. And in the parent-teacher conference, we had to make a decision. And so, Angel and I, we looked at each other, and we both kind of knew. The last year and a half of Teresa's life, the last two years, in fact, have been spent dealing as a child as a as a, a kindergartner and first grader. In fact, learning, I think at the end, it would be the end of preschool. And that whole time, to be in a world where mama and papa are, due to circumstance, focused almost exclusively on trying to save the life of her roommate, of her bunkmate, and her best friend. I cannot imagine what it feels like to be five years old, six years old, and to feel what she's felt or to see what she has seen. And to have to go to school on top of it Do your homework. Learn to read and write. It was hard on everybody. So we we made the call and said we want to hold her back. The boys caught on, but they promised they wouldn't say anything to Teresa. And we took her out to eat. We, went, we said, listen, you pick anywhere you want. Well, she picked Dave and Buster's, and there's no way in the world we weren't going to Dave and Buster's. It's going to cost us a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And so we said, don't, don't do that to us. And she, so she picked somewhere else. She picked a Chinese place. So we went out to eat together as a family. And I said, Teresa, I'm proud of you. We have something we need to talk to you about. And we all told her, every single one of us said that we were proud. And in fact, the boys started it. It wasn't even Angela. It wasn't myself. It was Athanasius and Ambrose, her two older brothers. And they both had reasons for why they were proud of her. She cried a little, but not sad. She was okay. She has a fear. She's asked me since, since that night, she asked me, what happens if I don't learn, even if I do it over again? That's a serious conversation. (laughs) That's, that's, I mean, be honest. 
highly unlikely because all of her words were close. And I think that's kind of a, a snapshot into where she's at. She's on, on the brink. She's right there at the edge of the precipice, totally there, about to fall off, free falling right into uh, right into second grade. So we're proud of her. There is zero shame, none. But it was one of those things, it was a first for our family. And I'm just so proud of how uh, the Team Tiny Dancer family dealt with it. I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of my wife. I'm proud of Teresa. And I'm proud of the school. Coit Creative Art Academy, I'm, I'm proud that they would be honest and speak to us in that way. So I'm just grateful for all these things. You know what? Listen, if you've got stories of your own that you'd like to talk about, it doesn't have to be about Donald Trump. It doesn't have to be about politics. I would love to talk about politics. i got a ton to talk about. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Paleo Radio. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them. You hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. All right, we're totally back. Thanks for that introduction, Nathan. I love that guy. Fantastic part of the show. I also want to give a big shout out to my rockin' wife, Angela. She joins me in the studio today. We've been having some issues with the headphones. Have we got the headphones completely figured out? Yeah. (laughs) So, okay. So, we've got these headphones figured out. I've got her here working the boards. I'm cracking the whip, aren't I? It's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. She hates every second of it with a smile. I don't like the whip. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So... Anyway, so it's uh, 616-656, and we've got a last different four numbers. It's 2619 today. So 616-656-2619. And listen, I apologize for taking that whole 15 minutes, that last segment, uh, just talking about uh, a situation involving my daughter and, and being held back and how we dealt with it. But, you know, I'll tell you, it, it was just... It's one of those things where I look at her every single day and I, I see how she grows and I see how my kids develop and, and what's going on. And I, I looked at it and I said, it actually just seems quite natural. In fact, it seems like that time uh, when we talk about time that was taken uh, from Samantha, there's a very real sense that time was taken from all of us, too. You know, not just not just Samantha going to chemo, but also Angela or myself going with her to chemo and, and in our relationship with our children in, in not being able to be with them. Anytime that we say that we're grateful for someone who worked to babysit our children is an admission that during that amount of time we were unable to be there for them. And it's just, it kind of, it, it, it broadens the way that you see what other people experience when something that's outside of your control at this point uh, comes to a head and that you have to make a decision and that you have to accept certain facts and you have to move on. But to make that person feel, I mean, listen, I, she's a rocking chick and we're super proud of her. And she's going to do fantastically, in fact, uh, we believe next year. Uh, in a different, it's going to have a different teacher, but it's going to be a, a good experience for her. And I, by that time, we're working with her. We've got her on a program. And actually, it, it's interesting, too, because the kids will be... Uh, working with some therapists as well. Not for any, they haven't expressed any kind of behavioral problems. Okay, there hasn't been any issues in that regard. Uh, but the school really kind of grasped what was going on and how, what happened to the kids over the summer and reached out to us and asked if we would be interested, and so we were. So it's just a really cool thing uh, to see this. But, you know, I was looking at news, right? And I, I'm, I'm trying to go through and saying, man, like what exactly uh, would be something fun to talk about or something interesting to talk about? And as I'm going through, I see this and it, and it really, it didn't shock me, but it bummed me out 
again, I mean, I guess I should just say, <laughs> I should say here for those who are just now tuning into the show, I should say, listen, doing the, doing the work that it takes to do this program is a real chore because you have to wade through garbage. You got to wade through something that just is nonsense. And here's a perfect example. <clears throat> Anthony Fisher. He interviewed Arkansas State Representative Kim Hendren. It's a dude. Uh, wants to create a safe space from Zinn's radical leftist take on history. It's an interesting thing. He introduced a one-page bill that would ban, quote, study books or any other material authored by or concerning Howard Zinn. And that it would be banned from the state's public schools, including charter schools. All right Now, he admits that he's not an expert. On Zen, okay, so he's, he's not an expert on what's going on, but he asserts that a number of his constituents have raised, quote, concerns about some of the approaches that Howard Zinn has taken to history in the books he's written. So it's not even really about the facts, right? It would seem to be about the approaches that Howard Zinn has taken to history. Now, what, what exactly, for people who are unaware Right of of who Howard Zinn is for people who are unaware. Howard Zinn he wrote a book that I was actually a lot like uh, State Representative Kim Hendren in a way when I first had to read the book. Uh, I, I read uh, People's History of the United States of America, and it was a challenging read because we were to read it. This is Olivet College, and we were to read this book. And do a daily journal. So we were supposed to write our thoughts. Just our thoughts and our feelings about what we had read in the book. And right from the get-go, Zinn is just, just going to town on Christopher Columbus. Right out of the gate. Right? <laughs> right out of the gate. He's talking about Christopher Columbus. and he, But here's the thing. He's quoting from diary entries. Not just from Christopher Columbus, but also from priests, one in particular, who were there at the time and knew the people that were involved in this and describing what's going on from a dissenting point of view. Stuff that not ordinarily in textbooks. It's a dissenting narrative. It's a dissenting narrative when talking about LGBTQ. You know, it, it's, it's a dissenting narrative when talking about the anti-war movement. When talking about civil rights. The whole book. His whole idea is that, okay, if history is written by the winners, right, it's part of the victor's spoil. If that's true, then a lot of losers' stories aren't being written. Which make it harder... <laughs> It makes it easier for winners to just simply maintain that. That's not even conspiratorial. I mean, it's, it's, by, it's by design if we admit that history is written by the winners. Seems to be true. You know, but I had to read this book, and so I'm reading this book, and boy, it was ticking me off, man. I mean, I was, I was mad about it. I was mad that we even had to read it. Then it really started clicking. You know, I wasn't even through Columbus before it started clicking. And it was tough because I was a Knight of Columbus. In fact, I was, I held, uh, I was an officer and I held two positions in the Knights of Columbus. And I was here, I, <laughs> here I am, an officer holding two positions in the Knights of Columbus, you know, with my parish and uh, reading Howard Zinn on Christopher Columbus. And really come into kind of a difficult place. I, mean, I remember looking up at the pictures that we have, these kind of these icons that we had of him, and just kind of feeling divided. You know, Hendren said, quote, "My basic personal philosophy is I think we ought to be open to hearing both sides of the situation and then try to do what's best for ourselves and our country. That's what'll happen with this bill. That's what he says. Now, the thing is, he says this is only meant to apply to uh, elementary schools as well as secondary schools, but that it doesn't apply to public colleges. 
Still. Still. You know, I, I guess that would be a fascinating debate. Maybe they've got a kind of C-SPAN there for the state house. We can watch that. When asked if he thinks this bill could set a precedent allowing for left-leaning states to ban conservative historian perspectives from being considered in public education, Hendren said, quote, Ultimately, the parents have a little more responsibility to what children are exposed to until they are a little bit older uh, to be able to exercise more judgment in college and so forth. I have no problem with it. So that's kind of, that's not really an answer. It's just, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, he's simply saying, well, it might, but hey, I kind of believe that parents have more responsibility over their stuff anyway. Interesting. For background, in late 2016, Hendren introduced a bill that would ban students from possessing any personal, electronic, or digital devices while at school, including video game consoles, cell phones, cameras, tablets, and pagers. It's kind of hilarious. The uh, <laughs> the person who, I, and I'm forgetting, who is this? Who is this? Who wrote this? I don't know if, it over, if it's over reason or not. Okay, I have to go back and look. But wrote in, in parentheticals, what year is this? About consoles, cell phones, cameras, tablets, and pages. Hey, I'm okay if schools, if our, if our kids, if at their school they had to check in their cell phones. Or something like that. I mean, I, hey, I'm not completely opposed. I'd be open to the arguments against that. But the idea that they desperately need that cell phone, that tablet, those cameras in class. Yeah, I don't know about that. But yeah, do you remember this? As a state senator running for a U.S. Senate seat in 2009, Hendren found himself in hot water when he referred to Senator Charles Schumer... Democrat New York, as, quote, that Jew. (laughs) You remember that? Yeah, he said, I don't use a teleprompter. This was his excuse, right, for for the that Jew thing. I mean, how does it, first of all, let me just ask for real. How does it just accidentally come out that way? Yeah, that guy's that Jew. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) How does that accidentally just come out? I don't know. But he says, I don't use a teleprompter. And occasionally I put my foot in my mouth. I was attempting to explain that unlike Senator Schumer, I believe in traditional values like we used to see on the Andy Griffith show. And it was at that point that I just wanted to kind of punch him in the face. I did. I just I wanted to just maybe just punch him. Of course, I wouldn't do that. Oh, but boy, my heart wanted to big time. Because I'm like, you know what? I like Andy Griffith's show. I do. But you know what? A lot of the stuff that's being talked about in Zinn's book happened during the time that they made the show. And it would be nice to know what was going on other than the stuff that's not real. Anyway, we'll be back with more Paleo Radio. Don't go anywhere, my friends. We're having a great time. We'll be back right after this. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome Welcome to Paleo Radio with your your host, host, Jeremiah Jeremiah Bannister Bannister and and Joe Joe Elder. Elder. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's the second hour. It's the second hour of Paleo Radio every single Monday from 10 to noon Eastern Standard Time. But listen, we love our audience on iTunes. We love our audience on Spreaker. We're trying to make it available on more more places like, like Stitcher, for example. What is it? Is it SoundCloud? Is that one of them, SoundCloud? We're trying to, there's a a number of different places that we're trying to work with uh, and see if we can get out there. Hey, listen, I'd love to get on iHeartRadio. I think it'd be fantastic. I don't see why we're not. I'm kind of blown away about this. 
<laughs> I mean, it's just totally true. You know, and so uh, 616-656, and then make sure, of course, to go to the new last four digits, 2619. Again, 616 656 Two six one nine. We were talking about Howard Zinn, and we were. My wife was asking me uh, about the last segment. You know, saying kind of like, "What does it mean uh, when the guy says that uh, when the the state senator, the state rep there in Arkansas, uh, says that he believes in traditional values?" Okay, we're talking about Hendren. This is back in two thousand nine, and he says, "I believe in traditional values." like we used to see on the Andy Griffith show. And I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, on the Andy Griffith show, what are things that what are things that Zinn talks about specifically? And I and again, I like the Andy Griffith show. I enjoy watching it. I do. I grew up on Nick at Night. But what are things that are just in Howard Zinn's book that might be relevant? I think one of them would be the LGBT thing. That'd be one of them. You seem to have a real, you know, uh, heteronormative thing going on. How about this other one talking about people of uh, religious minority groups? In in Andy Griffith, you I mean you really didn't have too much of that. It was it was a very uh, unified culture that was being presented, right? A very similar values. The worst kind of thing, the outliers were the people who drank too much. You know, maybe they got a little too crazy sometimes. But by and large, they kind of floated in the same world, same history, same language. Kind of John Jay's master vision of the world. But here's another one. A lot of white people. Lots and lots and lots of white people. And that, that's a huge, that plays a big role in Howard Zinn's work and what he talks about. And that's stuff that, you know, growing up, I'm watching, and I'd sit around and I'd watch it with my dad into the late hours. You know, we'd watch Nick at night. My dad still does. My, dad, my dad's one of those guys still watches Andy Griffith. I don't even know if he watches I Love Lucy at night. It might just be Andy Griffith. He might simply just watch that show at night. You know, but he, he loves the program. It, it, it's kind of the member berry thing for him. And it is for me, too, in a way. But I had to go back and think and do some self-reflection and say, man, boy, oh, boy, the world that's being presented here and the time frame and the stuff that was going on in America at the time. I mean, give me a break. There's a lot of racial stuff going on. It reflected small towns, reflected these kind of hidden away places like Little House on the Prairie like the Waltons. This is all kind of the same thing. You know, and so those would seem to be those values. But see, this is the thing. I, I, you got to just wonder with Hendren and say, you know, how much of a capitalist are you then? I mean, we've watched as, look, look at the things that, that have made uh, that culture go away. Are you going to blame Howard Zinn writing about stuff that actually happened, right? You don't have to treat that as if it's the only narrative. The point is that it's a narrative that happened. It's a narrative that's out there that doesn't necessarily always have to rival, although it does in many cases, rival the Victor story. But it's there to give a a special focus and emphasis. And in those instances where there was dissent and division, that people can still make the choice. That it's not simply settled, you know, in this way. So is, is Howard Zinn, is that a bigger reason why that culture is gone? Or would you say it has more to do with things like, I don't know, technology and trade? I'm being serious. I've seen people, I've seen people share those pictures where they've got uh, the couples. This would be really cool. I'd love to do this with my wife, actually. But to go to a, like a malt shop. And you got this couple, and they got their foreheads, you know, bumping up on each other. It's a real picture, a real vintage shot, for real. And then the boys got a bow tie, a nice blazer on, you know, dressed 
properly for the situation. The woman is wearing a nice dress, frilly, pretty, appropriate for the situation. And they're drinking out of the same malt. They've got the, the, they've got the straws, right? It's almost like the lady in the tramp thing with spaghetti, you know, where they're sucking on the spaghetti noodle until they smooch on the lips, that kind of thing. And I've seen people share it, modern people share it, and they say, man, I, I'll never forgive the generation that let this thing go away. And I'm like, man, give me a break, brah. You know, you're, you're the guy. Look, look at the way that business has changed. People on the one hand say, boy, I really want these business interests and stuff, but they don't understand that their philosophy and understanding of things to do with, let's say, corporations, for example, or even how banking may, may impact that, or how international, their views of international trade, or their views even, let's say, wow, of unionism, may, may in fact uh, impact a large number of these things. They're all factors. But to sit there and go, oh, it's Howard Zinn. I think Howard Zinn's the reason why. <laughs> it's just totally crazy. This guy's just, he's, he's off his rocker. All right, now I've been looking up this, trying to find the post that I got this from, and it's kind of bumming me out that, I, that I'm unable to find it. But I've had some people ask me recently. I've had some people ask me about whether or not I think that the media is in op- uh, open opposition to Donald Trump. And they've asked me about it. And they've asked me, you know, what do you, do, what do you think? Do you think that it's open opposition? Do you have a problem with that? Do you believe there is a such thing anymore as a mainstream media? Do you believe there's ever really been a such thing as a mainstream media? What are your thoughts on all these things? And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, if you look at it, yeah, I think that there is there is a serious problem going on with how our media is approaching um, the presidency. I don't believe it's just with Trump, though. I think it goes back a ways. And some of it is rooted, in fact, I think in good things. Like, I, I think it's generally okay for the media to have a, a kind of be, to be uh, there to be a shade of antagonism in a way between it and authority or it and institutions. I don't believe that it, it's the same posturing that goes on with activists, right? This kind of, I'm, I'm putting my heel in, you better kind of be a little nervous of me type thing. Although I do believe that politicians should at all times have that, uh, that fear in a way of what journalism can do. But can it go over the line? Can it just simply say, I don't like somebody, therefore, you know, I, I mean, is it possible for it to be biased? It seems like, well, I forget who did the study, but they were talking about, it's like 90% of coverage about Donald Trump during the election was negative. And so, you know, people talk about all the coverage that was done. And that's okay. We, that's a good thing to talk about. It's a valuable number. But then when talking about how much of that number was negative, then you get into a pretty, a pretty thick debate in media theory over, you know, immediate effect type stuff. You know, what does it do? Does the, does the proverbial uh, truth of, you know, uh, no news is bad news, does that still work if you're in the news constantly and it's negative? How does that play out? I mean, is it possible? I'd love to hear people's opinions on this. I'd love to hear what people think. Do they, do they believe that there are portions of the media? Is it, and let me just say this. When, when people ask the media, they're, at least in the, the question to me, they are framing it in a way to talk about mainstream media you know, and, and extending that a little bit. So, I mean, you would include groups like Huffington Post, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, CBS, NBC, Fox, you name it. I would broaden it even more. I'd broaden it to talk radio as well, especially conservative talk radio. I, I would include that in mainstream media for sure, given, given the numbers and their reach. It's a different medium, but it's, yeah, I mean, you're still, 
There's no reason why people should say, well, Bill O'Reilly's uh, TV broadcast reaches X number. And so if somebody reaches that same number or more on radio, that it's not as effectual or more. I, I just don't see any reason for that. But if you have, listen, if you have an opinion that differs from mine at any time, 616 656 2619. Again, 616 656 2619. But in this article, I was peeling away from and I got to go find this. I got to get my I got to get my people on it to figure this out. But it was saying no doubt that's why the president and some of his supporters felt that he needed to win his bizarre face off with journalists in the east room, you know, talking about uh there being this opposition going on, this antagonism going on. Overall though, the press has found it difficult to mount an effective response to Trump. And I think this is true. You know, and, and they're, they're getting better at it. I mean, so is the Democratic Party. I mean, that was one thing that they were behind until the very end. I mean, I, I remember you, you, would have, uh, you would have Trump just uh, nailing it on the news cycle, just crushing it. He'd wait until the perfect time. He knew how it worked on the weekends and weekdays. He knew how to play that game. And every single thing that they would try to launch – at him, he always had a way to to flip that narrative, right? And he he would win the hashtag war all the time. But it, it doesn't change the nature of the the fight going on between him and the media. And I think there really is one. I think it's true. And I think that on some issues, hey, I get it. But is that how the media ought to work? I'm interested in your take. Again, 616-656-2619. We'll be right back. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. I had a great time with Justin Schieber of Real Atheology recently. He invited me to go to his debate. He does this from time to time. I always have a good time with the guy. You know, we get together beforehand. I'll, you know, I'll say, hey, I'll ride with you. Or he'll call me and ask to ride. And we'll go uh, together. We'll enjoy ourselves. I'll take some pictures and everything else. I took some pictures this time, but I wish... Boy, if I hadn't sprained my butt, (laughs) if I hadn't done that, oh, I was having a hard time that night. I was kind of limping around a little. I had my cane with me. For the story behind that, you got to listen to the beginning of the show once we publish it, which will be later today on iTunes and on Spreaker. So you got to make sure to subscribe to us and make sure to put a review uh, up there as well. But he did a great job. It was over um, God and the problem of suffering. And it was a great one. It took, it took place at the Cook DeWitt building, right? At the Cook uh, Clarion Tower, right? It was immediate, uh, immediately northeast of that. It's a really cool uh, place at the campus there. Okay, it was a pretty auditorium. It had, they have a, a really nice uh, pipe organ that, you know, just kind of loomed up high. I tried to capture that in one of the images I got from the back. The lighting, we made sure that they got the lighting all set up, so it was real pretty where the crowd, the audience, it was very dark, and the people on stage kind of had this spotlight look to it. So it was real good, an excellent back and forth. Of course, I think that I think Justin won, but it was it was Justin taking a, the atheist position on this, or an atheist position on it, versus Christian theist uh, Timothy Arndt, and he's of Ratio Christi. I think I asked him if he was a student, and he said he was not. He said he's the, I don't know if he's the regional or state leader of Ratio Christi, uh, but I got to talk to him. I got to talk to the moderator, had a great time. In fact, that's a bummer because Justin, you know, he's kind of shooting himself in the foot over it because he said that he was really kind of hoping after he realized that the, uh, that uh, Timothy had chosen a moderator that he realized he's like, you know, I really wish I would have asked for you uh, to do that. And so, and I, of course, I would have loved it, told him to keep me in mind. And we'd love to do anything like that. If you would like for us to 
host or moderate a debate or take part in a debate, if there's something you say, man, I really – some stuff these guys say that just really tick me off, I'd love to debate them over these issues. Or I'd love to interview them. Make sure to get a hold of us at Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. So we've been talking here about the media and Trump, right? And I figured it out. It's over at, uh, over at the, the Nation. That's where this article originally – uh, comes from is the nation it says this article is one of three being co-published by the nation and CJR that's Columbia Journalism Review as part of a special issue of the nation on quote media in the Trump era which would be available online in full on March 2nd so you can go right now and you can go to the nation and you can read the entirety uh, of of their take anyway and different contributors that they've reached out to on their take for what should be done during you know with the media how should the media behave right and he says that that uh, when talking about how the media has found it difficult to mount an effective response to trump right when talking about different issues that the media and journalists find themselves trapped in dysfunctional practices that it regards as foundational so the writer the writers of this are challenging the writers of this are challenging uh, things that are literally foundational to media theory, right? And the understanding of of journalism that journalists have studied and adhered to uh, maybe for a long time. And these have been debated. I mean, I don't, I don't want people to get this idea that uh, just because it's a prevailing idea that it goes without debate. I mean, that's just, <laughs> there's rigorous debate and disagreement over whether or not these are good things. Are they even realistic? And those these two habits that stand out most in the in the writing is an insistence that the press must pretend uh, to Olympian neutrality and a conviction that access to the powerful is good per se. Both of those things is fascinating debate if you think about it. You know that if you sit there and you say, well, that they need to be that they need to be neutral. That they need to have this kind of thing that says, well, I have to show both sides equally and not point to one as being worse than the other. I don't really know many people in the field that really do that. I don't even think, and I'm sorry I'm to say this, but I don't even think that there's enough introspection in a day and age where the majority of journalists aren't even journalists. They haven't studied media law. They haven't studied media ethics. They haven't studied media theory. Most of the people doing this work. And most of them are just head over heels for teams. Show me this bastion of people with this Olympian neutrality. Show me where they are. Who are these people? Now, the, the second, you know, the idea that access to the powerful is good per se. I don't even, yeah, you know, I mean, let's read on, I guess. These two beliefs coincide with the persistence of a journalistic professional class that was educated in elite institutions. Well, not always elite, but we were educated in them. Is convinced of its place within the machinery of power. Well, I mean, maybe and has forgotten its blue-collar roots, which are literally invisible in most newsrooms now that printing presses have moved to distant suburban plants and computers have replaced hot lead. Hey, you know, there, there's, a, there's a point to this in a way, that these beliefs, but I don't, you know, I don't really know. I mean, when they say, well, you don't have the machinery, you don't have the, you know, you forgot your roots, and so now journalists don't don't care about this anymore. I, I don't think that's really why. I don't were they more neutral? Right? I where are they going with this? Two these two beliefs coincide with the persistence of a journalistic professional class that was educated in elite institutions, is convinced of its place within the machinery of power, and has forgotten its blue collar roots. Okay. So what's the job of journalism in, this, in, the, in the paper here? If the press believes his job is to convey messages from the nation's leaders rather than to hold them to account, 
The news organizations need only send their most polished stenographers to the White House briefing room and carry the proceedings live, lies and all. Okay. (laughs) It's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, if you... If you don't like my idea, then I guess you should just go all the way in the other direction. Am I the only person getting that? If the press believes his job is to convey messages from the nation's leaders, that is one of the jobs that it has, is to to accurately convey those messages from leaders. In the past it has. The media, they had monopoly rights in a way. Any, Any person who owned... Any kind of device and machinery that could publish large amounts of papers, right? You had to go to them. You now you could email it, I guess, mass mailing, and they're doing that now. You can just get an email from the White House, and so people did kind of send some polished stenographers, right? They kind of did a little. But I don't think that's the way it entirely works. And look, I'm, I'm a critic of the way that the media covers the White House. You know, I think there's some antagonism. I wouldn't say it's entire and full. Do they, you know, do they do the bidding at times? Sure. But should they carry the video live? Lies and all? Yeah, they should, man. Yeah, you should. You should carry the proceedings live, lies and all. You should you should do that. And when you publish it, you should have fact checks. That is what you should do. Because that is actually real. And if you don't do it, somebody else might. It's kind of like Hillary falling over on September 11th and needing to be hauled into her van. All of the media turned the cameras off. Other people didn't. It really happened. That's a real life thing that took place. So, yes, you should cover it and you should talk about the lies. It goes further. But if the job of journalists is to be balanced, they will invite Conway on to their programs as a representative of the president. Even if she adds no new information or worse, invents a Bowling Green massacre to justify his travel ban. They may snort at her in derision, as Todd did when she coined the term alternative facts. But that only enables the propagandists to label journalists as an arrogant coastal elite. In a way, they have every right to label journalists as an arrogant coastal elite because in many ways they are an arrogant coastal elite. But it would be a logical fallacy to say, oh, they're, they are a, an arrogant coastal elite, therefore we can trust nothing of what they say. Or we can't trust anything that they say because they got money. That would be a lot. That would be a logical fallacy. That'd be a silly thing to do. And yes, I mean, look, the truth is, as long as as long as we have a visual medium, as long as we have a visual medium like TV, we are going to be scraping bottom of the barrel stuff. It's just a fact. They're not looking for people who are nuanced. They're not looking for intellectuals for Trump. They're not looking for really intellectuals at all. They're not looking for reporters at all. How many people do you see up there? And it's okay. I mean, look, people people can get into this line of business and not go through the, the avenues of going for media and journalism. But man, it gets old when you go bio after bio. It says actor. Getting our news, and we're all getting in a bunch, all ticked off by an actor pretending to be a news person and then going on comedy shows to say, well, there is some shtick to what I'm doing. So, what is the job of journalists? You know, are they going to be, to be balanced? Are they going to bring on people from the perspective that's out there? Yeah, they're going to do that. And hey, if that perspective ends up winning the Electoral College and becoming president and has an administration and everything else, then yes, I would totally think that's what a journalist would do. But in the piece it says, we're still, if journalists insist on appearing neutral, 
They'll avoid asking hard-edged questions or calling a lie a lie. It's true. They'll hesitate. That's a good hesitation. Instead, they'll default to mealy mouth formulations like, what do you say to those of your critics who argue that blank, blank, blank? I think it's a good job. We'll be back. 616-656-2619. More Paleo Radio right after this break. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Thank you so much for that introduction there, Nathan. You're listening to Paleo Radio every Monday, 10 to noon, live here in studio, Public Reality Radio in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You can also subscribe to us. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to give us a review. We love those. You can do that over on iTunes and on Spreaker. All of our episodes are completely free. I'm Jeremiah Bannister. I'll be hosting the show uh, today, all by my lonesome, right, on the mic. I got my wife my wife in the studio with me. Yeah, it's true. I get all choked up when she's in the studio. I lose my voice. Yeah. You take my breath away. It's true, 100%. So anyway, I got her in the studio with me. She's ordinarily uh, in the call room, but she's over here just hanging out with me today in the studio. So if you would like to give us a call, the number's a little bit different but we're going to give it to you twice, so make sure to have your trusty pen and pencil and piece of paper handy or your phone and put it in, 616-656-2619. Uh, I was talking last segment uh, about about the media and about Trump and whether or not the media, what should be the uh, posturing of the media. But we've also talked about Howard Zinn. We also talked about uh, a family situation about my daughter being being held back. And talking about the conversation, how we broke it to her as a family. Uh, a real touching conversation. But if there is anything that you would like to bring up that we've talked about thus far, make sure to give us a call again, 616-656-2619. That's 616-656-2619. The last thing I'm going to say about this article uh, over at The Nation, right? It's a, a piece put together by them uh, and by Columbia Journalism Review is the last the last thing going to say these these questions about olympian neutrality i don't i don't even think many people have that i just don't you know i don't think that's a good diagno- a good diagnosis of what is going on with this right or a conviction that access to powerful the powerful is good per se now that that i can see i can see that as a, as something that's for real right but talking about uh, you know, w- wanting to have a better proximity within the machinery of power. This is a real thing. This has a lot to do uh, with their their money structure, too. Right? I mean, this is an institutional thing. This is a legacy institution with, with some old ways of looking at things. Uh, you know, but I, I guess the last thing I'll say is this. Uh, if the job of journalists, and this is to quote, if the job of journalists is to be balanced, right, they'll invite the Conway folks in there. But for the press to articulate the politics of independence, accountability, fairness, and accuracy, and then to choose its words on that basis is not partisan. Now, that's a, that's a lofty thing, right? To articulate a politics of independence, accountability, fairness, and accuracy, and then to choose its words on that basis. That's true. It would not, if someone did that, it would not be partisan. Nor does the press risk its credibility with such reporting any more than it currently does with the phony he said, she said formulations. That's not phony. That's people having disagreements. And that's a journalist saying that they aren't necessarily the arbiters of that. And even those who, who brave it and say, I'll do a fact check. And I, I, I'm going to go ahead and take, hey, take some of the easier cases. You're going to have a place fact check. You're going to have a multiplicity of fact checkers now. That's going to happen. People are going to cherry pick and they're going to accuse the others of cherry picking. Some will be seen to be more reliable by different audiences. It's just going to happen. You got to do it. I mean, you got it. You got to put your best foot forward and do some fact checking. But you also just got to admit, I mean, look, he said, she said, that's the way it works. There's people that talk. There are differences of opinion and whether or not you think an opinion is right or factual doesn't doesn't have any bearing on whether or not it's actually making advances politically. 
It's just a fact. It's going to make advances politically. And so you got to talk about it. It's good to talk about the he said, she said. And you know, listen, I guess I can agree with the writers to this extent. As I would say, I, I think we do need to kind of soften down on the idea that anyone is actually being objective or nonpartisan all the time and that, you know, well, I work for this legacy institution, therefore I do X, Y, Z. That's nonsense. That's not, that's not real. And so I think if we just all kind of get on that page and say, look, that's the way it's worked always. Then it's always been a he said, she said. You know, we're simply letting people speak for themselves. And if a, if a group wants to be uh, partisan, if they, they at least don't have to lie about it anymore. They can stand by their opinions and their writing. They don't have to ever feel like maybe they had a real subtle inclusion in something. Let it, let it stand or fall where it is. You know? I think it'd be a decent idea. Let's go to the phone. Right away, we're going to go to Chris in GR. He's listening on FM radio. Welcome to the program, Chris. Hi, this is Chris, and I'm a female surprise. Yes, hi. Um, I was thinking, because I'm racking my brain because you've got so much going on, um, what would help us facilitate our communication is if we take a step back and maybe teach what we preach. If we teach what we preach. Yeah. Yeah, give us an example. Lead us along the way for a second. Mm, no. Well, instead of just talking off the top of our heads with critiques and stuff, what helps me is instead of pointing a figure, finger at somebody and being negative, I point three back at myself and I question and debate myself first before I open my mouth. Hmm. Do you ever get to the point where you've overcome those those three criticisms and get to the point where you can debate the thing that came up? Um, it's also a good idea. I'm going to switch gear on you there because I'm not good at answering questions. Okay, you're good. You're um, good. but maybe take the opposite side of your critique and preach it. Mm-hmm. Or if you have a really passionate idea, teach it to somebody who doesn't know what you're saying, mm-hmm. doesn't know what your beliefs are because we're all different. And we might even learn something from one another in the debate. I agree with you. Thank you so much for the phone call, Chris. Okay. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much for calling. Mm, bye-bye. Yes. All right. And again, that phone number, if you'd like to add uh, to what she said or you'd like to add something else to the discussion, 616-656-2619. You know, when talking about the word lie, well, actually, you know what? Let's let's focus on what Chris said for a second, you know, being able to, uh, being able to simply talk to each other, understand the other people's position or... You know, be honest about some criticisms of your own position, that your own position has uh, a leaky bucket, right? That you're not walking around like some magic man coming down from a mountain saying, look, everybody, I've got a perfect bucket for y'all. Like, everybody's got some issues with something. The the moment, and I deal with this with libertarians, and I hate saying this, and I, I this isn't to target one group, but I don't want to have to just go and use any group and it, it would take forever. Um, but... I get this with libertarians, and I've asked them. I've said, well, what would be the, the hidden cost of what you would prescribe? What are things that might happen? What's potential blowback, to loosely use that term? What's potential blowback from what you're proposing? A society that would be ideal for you. What are problems that may arise that you might be like, wow, I, that'd be a surprise. Maybe not entirely surprising, but boy, that's a tough one. And I hear all the time, Nothing. I can't think of nothing. Well, that's just ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. At that point, it's magic. At that point, you know, it's it's silly putty. It's Plato. You can you can just shift and move it however you want and say, well, you know, I I this is what I like. I'm going to play with the facts this way. And to to one degree or another, you know what? We all kind of do it. We all do. And that's because in our heart of hearts, we all know that whatever position that we maintain is probably, in fact, by probably, I mean like almost, almost certainly a leaky bucket. Almost certainly there is a problem. Almost certainly it will not be forever 
what needs to be done for all people at all times and in all places. Coming down ex cathedra from the throne of St. Peter with this stuff. Moses on the mountain with it. My system is perfect. It will not result in anything I did not foresee. <laughs> like, I mean, give me a break. Totally absurd. And what would we say about approaching journalism the way that the people at the nation believed? What are possible problems? You know, you can read, you can read much more about it. It kind of gets into this apocalyptic, you know, end of journalism, we are the resistance type stuff. But that's also the nation. I mean, the nation, <laughs> yeah. And that's what we also have to just broaden what we mean by when we say partisan. People are like, oh, well, what you mean by that is, well, you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. Well, maybe. Not necessarily. Depends on what you're talking about. You know, you got silos all over the place. We have this really cartoony way of understanding groups and people and everything else. I saw this on Switching Gears, and of course, it's a perfect segue. I saw this on my friend Mark Nebo's page, and I'm trying to, I, I want to get him on. I want to get his, his wife too, Shannon. I want to get both of them on the show, but it's tough because of the timing, right? So we have a hard time getting it on there. But he said something here, and I, I, I would like to hear what everybody else has to say about this. But he's, he's been kind of doing this sorry, not sorry thing, and some of them are real good. You know, he'll say some stuff, and I'm like, oh, yeah, man, I agree with that. It seems pretty true. But he said something here, and I'm like, oh, man, I just don't know. And so I want your opinion on this. Here's what he said. Saying you are a sapiosexual is elitist, classist BS. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. So my question, I should have asked this at the beginning of the show. I guess I should have. Is to say, is it? Is it elitist and classist in a bad way (laughs) to be a sapiosexual? And for people who don't know, maybe someone who gets uh, turned on by smart people, right? Intellectual people, or at least people who are, are able to express their intelligence, right? So, I mean, some might be super bright, but if they never talk and express that or demonstrate it in some way, you just simply never know. So anyone who can express their intelligence in, a, in some way, do you find that to be attractive? That, and you hear it all the time, don't you? I mean, people say, well, you know, I just, ah, I really liked him. But boy, it was tough having a conversation, not going to lie. Kind of like talking to a brick wall. You know, so I, I took a position. I'm just going to say it. You know, I was like, I don't know what people are to do. You know, how do you take up that cross every single day? These are some some seriously primal preferences. <laughs> what would someone have to do? Uh, 616-656-2619. We'll be right right after this. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. I can't even believe that the show's almost over. It's unbelievable. An hour and 45 minutes has passed. Ah, What are we now? Episode number 68. You can find every episode that we've ever done entirely for free. So I encourage you to go find us on iTunes as well as on Spreaker. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Look up Paleo Radio Show. Uh, We're also verified on Facebook. So you got to find us at Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. It's got the little check mark. So you got to check us out there. And I mentioned the whole sapiosexual thing. Is it classist? Is it elitist to be a sapiosexual? Is that the truth? You know, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. And of course, uh, today, because of the technical difficulties, the number 616-656-2619. Again, 616-656-2619. I, I'm looking at these last minutes here. 
And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, what do I, what do I even want to do? What do I even want to talk about? I, honest to goodness, honest to goodness, I, I could have just talked about Family Matters, the book, Team Tiny Dancer Story, that I'm working on. I went to Schuler Books, actually, and checked out their espresso printer that they have that prints out paperback. It's a very cool thing, looking into the pricing of it. I'd be able to make Samantha's story uh, accessible on Kindle, any kind of uh, app or device electronically. It'd be in the National Library. There's a whole bunch of perks to it. It costs money. So we'd probably put a Kickstarter together. I could talk about that. I could talk about speeches coming up that I've got, stuff with the Hospice of Michigan. I'm going to be on a panel talking about end-of-life stuff. It's going to be a bunch of fun. I want to bring them in here, actually, uh, and do some interviews with them on that. I'm going to be doing stuff. I'm writing a speech, actually, for my friend uh, Bobby Carey, Hope After Faith. I mean, this is, like, big-time stuff. Big time awesome. I would love to talk about all that. And not even have to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I guess the I guess the most controversial I'd like to get would be to talk about the sapiosexual stuff. <laughs> and say, you know, is that the case? Or, or you know, funniest parenting tweets. You know, stuff like if you're looking for ideas, a family bike ride is another fun way to sit and listen to your kids complain for an hour. Kate Hall. <laughs> you know, talk about stuff like that. Maybe talk about Alex Jones and whether or not he's just kind of become a a tool of the establishment now that now that Trump's in there. He seems to all of a sudden really, really love the government. Hardly, hardly a negative thing to, to really say anymore. I mean, it's kind of like, well, police states are only bad if my, you know, the other team is in power type stuff. It's interesting to hear to talk about that, to talk about. You know, the claims that have been made, even by the president, that maybe Barack Obama is part of the resistance. Talk about that. Talk about Dems in Russia. Fascinating, fascinating piece that I stumbled on, saw recently. Got a whole bunch of these folks meeting with people, including Claire McCaskill. I don't know if anybody saw this on Twitter. That was hilarious. She goes on Twitter She goes, I've been on the Armed Services Committee for 10 years. No call or meeting with a Russian ambassador, ever. Ambassadors call members of Foreign Relations Committee. And then somebody reminded her a couple of years ago on Twitter, off to meeting with Russian ambassador, upset about the arbitrary, cruel decision to end all U.S. adoptions, uh, even those in process. So, hey, there was a reason to go. And then, uh, let's see, oh, there's another one. A couple years later, actually, this one be 2015. Today calls with British, Russian, and German ambassadors regarding the Iran deal. Hashtag doing my homework. And it's not, I mean, look, this, this Kislyak guy, it's hilarious. This ambassador dude at the center, of this, have you seen this guy? Hard to forget. There's a whole laundry list of these people, these Democrats who've seen him and spent some time. Mary Landrew of Louisiana. Maria Cantwell of Washington. What is it, Klobuchar? Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. Jack Reed of Rhode Island. Robert Casey of Pennsylvania. Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. Claire McGaskill. Obama apparently met with him 22 times. And that's between September of 2009 in September of 2016, you got Nancy Pelosi specifically saying that she never met with Kislyak. Specifically. But then there's a picture that's shared by Politico where there she is, right across from him, in a meeting. We talk about that. We talk about Le Pen. About how European elites... May martyr Marine Le Pen over a tweet. It's crazy stuff by Rod Dreher. Those stupid, stupid people. Quoting from an article, European Union lawmakers lifted the EU parliamentary immunity 
A French presidential candidate, Marine Le Pen, on Thursday for tweeting pictures of Islamic State violence. The immunity shielded her from prosecution by lifting it after a request from the French judiciary. The parliament is allowing any eventual legal action against her. The move grants the prosecutor looking into the affair power to bring Le Pen in for police questioning. In the next steps, the prosecutor could drop the case, appoint an investigation magistrate to delve further into the tweets, or send it straight to trial. A trial date ahead of the election in April and May would require the French legal process to go much faster than it normally does. Look at that. Look at that. For publishing violent images of terrorists. Could go to jail. I mean, I, I think there was what? It said it could be up to three years. That's just crazy town. That's totally crazy. You know, and she brought up, here's the thing, it's just, it's just crazy. A guy brought up in the comment section, James C. And why does she tweet those images? Because a French journalist equated her party to the Islamic State. In response to that out- outrageous provocation, she addressed him and posted images with the caption, Daesh is this. Ah, look at that. We could talk about that in the last five minutes. We could talk about the Trump speech. Talk about day without women. It's going to be a protest that's going to be going on. And there's so much stuff. There's so much stuff. And, and look, every single one of these things, every single one of these is sad, infuriating, challenging to the core, some of them. It's a wild time to be alive. You've also got here uh, two pieces by Jason Ditz over at Antiwar.com. Official Pentagon report, again, dramatically underreports Iraq and Syria civilian deaths. The official toll is less than 10% of NGO estimates. The Pentagon, and by the way, I, I must, as, uh, as a disclaimer, admit that antiwar.com uh, is, is listed by the government <laughs> as uh, being a, a part of the whole Russian deal. The Pentagon, uh, the latest official accounting of civilians killed in U.S. airstrikes in Iraq and Syria, follows the same formula as all of the previous reports, admitting to just a tiny fraction of the number of civilians known to be killed. Yeah. Not looking good. Leaves the overall uh, toll laughably below the estimates by interested NGOs. The Pentagon would only confirm 21 civilian deaths over the course of three months. Despite those months covering virtually the whole start of the Iraq invasion of Mosul, indeed just one media report from mid-January showed U.S.-led airstrikes killing 25 to 30 civilians in a single incident. It didn't make it into the official account. We talk about that. You know, where the, where the groups that monitor these things come to an estimate of, I don't know, 2,463 civilians. And the government goes, well, uh, it's actually more like 220. I mean, come on. It sounds like my kids. And they get in trouble. And then you've got the Trump administration plans for dramatic reductions to foreign aid. Budget director cuts will allow for more specific uh, spending at home. Speaking on Fox News over the weekend, White House Office of Management and budget director confirmed plans for what he described as fairly dramatic reductions in U.S. foreign and spending in the upcoming 2008 budget. They're going to come out of both the State Department's budget and U.S. AIDS program. They believe that they could cut it as much as 37%. It'll be interesting. While President Trump also talked up a $1 trillion increase in infrastructure spending uh, at his most recent congressional address, the cuts to foreign aid are likely to be only a fraction of the money sought just to pay for military spending increases. The combined State Department and U.S. aid budgets are about $50 billion total, which even if it was cut to nothing, 
is short of the $54 billion sought for military spending hikes. We're talking about all that stuff. It's an interesting day to be alive, my friends. Listen, I strongly encourage you, find us on Facebook. Find us there. Find us on Twitter at Paleo Radio Show. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash paleo radio. We're verified. Look for the, the black logo with the white words and the little check mark by it. I hope you've had fun. Make sure to share our iTunes and Spreaker accounts. We'll try to make sure to have this available later on in the afternoon. It's going to be a bunch of fun. And remember, next week, Joe Elder will be back on the show. We wish him well in California. Thank you so much for being with us, and have a great night. You're listening to Public Reality Radio, WPRR 1680 AM, Ada, 90.1 FM, Clyde Township, 95.3 FM, Grand Rapids, 102.5 FM, Comstock Park, and WPJC 88.3 FM, Pontiac, Illinois.